Since before recorded history, the people of Britain have had first-hand experience of the strange and unusual spirits who haunt ancient castles, stories of werewolves and banshees roaming the countryside, and fantastic creatures like gnomes, fairies and pixies, all are firmly embedded in our native folklore. This cultural experience makes us uniquely qualified to research these types of phenomena and help us find the truth of the reality that surrounds us. So sit back and relax as your hosts, Irene Allen Block and Mark Johnson, take you on a journey through this strange realm and together help us find the answers to the mysteries that lie just beyond our grasp. Welcome to Paranormal UK Radio. Hi everybody, this is Irene Allen Block from the Paranormal UK Radio Show, the flagship show on the Paranormal UK Radio Network. And I'm here today again with Marky Johnson. (laughs) Hello. Johnson, Mark Johnson. Yes, hello, sweetie. That's me. <laughs> Sorry, but it's, it did. It happened. I had to think there, Mark. Well, I you know thinking is uh, not your strong suit, so. No, no, it's not. But I had to think. Who the hell? Who the heck is it tonight? Is it? A, you know, I don't know where I am today. So you'll have to excuse me, everybody. But my head is all in a turmoil. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Not helped by having Mark around, obviously. No, no, I usually have that effect on you. <laughs> yeah, you can put me in a spin. I've got to admit that. You can put me in a spin. Not anyway. intentionally. Yep, so what's been happening? Oh, what's been happening? Well, you know, we still are dealing with uh, lots of winter here. Got s- seven inches of snow last night. Yeah? Yeah. Well, we've just, we've just come through Storm Freya. And um, she's done quite a bit of damage in my garden, blown a few things around again. Freya or Freya? Freya. 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 Like the Norse Norse goddess. That's it. And that's where she headed off to afterwards. So uh, they must have known it was going to go that way. And that's more than likely why they named it Freya, you know. And uh, but she's left behind rain, rain, rain as usual. And that's what you expect in Wales this time of the year. Oh, lovely. Obviously. Yeah. We had summer last week. <laughs> <laughs> so you had summer last week. Now you're yes, back to yes, winter. We and three, Yeah, that's it. We're back into winter now. First day of spring, isn't it? Uh, yesterday, last, when, when was it? Friday? When was the first day of spring? Not for another two weeks, the 21st. Oh, yeah, but you don't have it at the same time as us. Yeah, we do. I'm sure ours started on Friday. I'm sure they were talking about it being for last Friday. Mm. Anyway, we, we did have three or four days of sunshine, and it was absolutely beautiful. T-shirt, weather, flip-flops, the whole caboodle. And uh, now it's back to winter. It's freezing cold. Pouring with rain, we've had the winds blowing, everything's back to normal again. So I suppose it'll stay like this for the rest of the year. Well, I know over here in the States, people are ready to go groundhog hunting. Groundhog hunting? Yes, the groundhog on February 2nd predicted an early spring and the little rodent bastard lied. Because <clears throat> we, the whole country has been well, getting... What do you expect him to do? You keep bloody waking him up, poor bugger. Well, I know. I think he gives bad predictions on purpose just to mess with them because, you know, they yank him out of a deep sleep, shove yeah. him into the daylight, say, do you see your shadow? Do you see your shadow? <laughs> and he's going, do what? <laughs> <laughs> <He's>... <laughs> Poor little devil. Can you imagine? He's still hibernating. Why wake up a hibernating creature? Uh, because it, Why not leave it to wake up naturally like we do with our hedgehogs? Because they can't wait. They have to have tradition. Oh, yeah. But just for him to see a shadow. Hold up a stick. If you can see a shadow, well, then you know it's there. <laughs> This thing is not going to turn around and say, yeah, it's over there, isn't it? It's not going to... Sorry about taking the mickey out of this, everybody, but, you know, especially out in America. But I do find... I know it's a tradition. I know it's a tradition. 
And I know it's a lot of fun, but is it right to wake up a sleeping animal before it's time just to see if it sees its shadow when it can't even answer you and tell you whether it does or not? <laughs> Let's put it this way. It's probably the stupidest holiday I've ever heard of. Yeah, I say. It is. And what do you mean by groundhog hunting? Does that mean they're going out hunting a few more? No, it means that see, people... They see those shadows too. Pe- people <laughs> are ready to shoot the varmint for giving us a bad prediction, saying spring was coming early, and now everyone's getting clobbered with uh, tons of more snow all across the country. So, really, they're not really groundhog hunting? Not literally. People I want hope. to be. Ah, oh, well, I hope not. People want I, I, I do. We've got a few stupid uh, traditions here. I can't name one because I can't think of one, but I'm sure we must have a few. But that one, you know? Dwarf tossing? Dwarf tossing. Welly boot tossing. <laughs> we do toss the welly boot. I have no idea what a welly boot is. A galosh, galoshes. Oh, rubber boots that you put on your feet when you go in the mud, and one thing, you know, they do toss the welly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. See how far it can get. You know, it would be ideal to do it with a ball, but no, a welly, welly is a lot more fun. That is a stupid tradition that we've got. I've got to admit that. Well, it's better a welly than a willy. <laughs> What? People are tossing <laughs> willies. That might get some someone arrested. Oh, do you know what a willie is here? Yes, that's why I said it. It's a pickled gherkin, Mark. Yes, I'm aware of that. <laughs> oh, no, that's a wally. Sorry. <laughs> I'm getting it wrong. It's not a willie. It's a wally. Uh-huh. A, wally a wally is a pickled gherkin. Okay, this is really getting into bad territory here. Oh, so. before we go anywhere else, what about my website? I've got a website, people. Yes. and I, Yes, I have. Don't ask me what it is, but I have got a website, <laughs> and I would be very grateful if you could go on there, maybe say some nice things. Forget about the nasty things, because you know me. Someone says not something nasty about me. I do give them a shout out on the radio. So to find Irene's website where you can purchase her books and also catch up on her musings on her blog, go to IreneAllenBlock.com. Now, Allen is A-L-L-E-N. So all one word, IreneAllenBlock.com, and you can uh, purchase all three of Irene's books, and uh, she updates the blogs with uh, some of her musings weekly. My thoughts, yeah, my thoughts. It's a, it's Alan with double L and an E and Block with a K. B L L B L O C K. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah. check it out and uh, let's drive some traffic towards the people. Yeah, and be nice, be yes. nice because I don't like nastiness. Nope, no nastiness here. No, even when we want to be, no nastiness. Oh, and I wrote something on there about the ring. If anybody can give me any answers on that ring, I would be very, very grateful. Wouldn't we, Mark? Yes. Hmm. One question. Have you ever had anybody try psychometry on it? No. Hmm. I've never put it into anybody's hands. And I felt things from it, so no. Okay. I wouldn't do that. I you, wouldn't do that. You wouldn't allow somebody else to get impressions off of it? Not unless they were really, really good. Okay. Mm. All right. Just something to think about. Yeah. Okay. Well, why don't we go yeah. ahead and get on with our show? Mm-hmm. So who's our guest tonight? You tell me. <laughs> yeah, you can't remember my name. You're going to remember our guest's name? Yvonne Smith. Yes. Our guest tonight is Yvonne Smith, who's the author of The Grey Ones. Uh, Mm -hmm. Yvonne, welcome to the program. Hello, both of you. Good evening. Hello. (laughs) Now, uh, Yvonne, where are you uh, currently coming to us from? The Netherlands. I've only recently, well, recently, a year and a half ago, um, I've moved to the Netherlands. But I've lived in the UK for 26 years. But you are Dutch, aren't you? 
I am by yeah by origin Dutch. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I'm married to a British man. So. Do you know? I used to be over there every weekend, nearly. Where whereabouts in the Netherlands? Oh, Amsterdam. I used oh, to say, uh, yeah, there used to be a place I stayed called the Old Nickel in the red light area. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I don't know whether you know it. Um, my whole family comes from Amsterdam and the red light district is the best place to go out, to be honest. Yeah, I know it is. Yeah, it's it true, it is. It was a lot of fun. I was not working there, people. I was not. <laughs> <laughs> so you say. No, it was the old nickel, and it was in Amsterdam, right, where I was dancing on the bar, on the bar, in a bar one night, when I had that punch-up with the Germans. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Irene has been involved in bar fights. <laughs> yes, many bar fights. I uh, love a bar scrap. Yeah, you're a scrapper in your youth. Yeah. So, well, so I, used to be out, I used to be out there every weekend. Nearly every weekend. I've done a lot of work there. Now, I've never been to the Netherlands. Um, I was looking at it on the map. Fantastic. Um, Easy to miss on the map. <laughs> well, I was looking I at your town on the map, and I saw that you were relatively close to Eindhoven. Yes, that's correct. And, yeah. uh, you know, with recent history, Eindhoven really stood out for me because uh, I, I was a fan of there was that HBO miniseries Band of Brothers. And they were talking about the World War II um, and uh, the the U.S. paratroopers that came in through Eindhoven helped liberate it from the Germans. Of course, then they lost it <laughs> during our market garden. But uh, yeah, yeah, that's I found that that was a really interesting uh, interesting period. I'm a World War II buff, so oh, you have to come over there because there's still so much to see. It's pretty incredible. Let's say that. Um, yeah. This ex-military, and the first thing he wanted to see was the um, the bridge, the ever so famous bridge that has been fought over uh, near Arnhem. Arnhem, so that, yeah. yeah, yeah. The that bridge was famous. They made a fi <laughs> they made a film of that too, Mark. What well, was that? a yeah. bridge too far? I believe. Yeah, a bridge too far. Yeah, but the, I tell you, the one place that really, really tugged at my heartstrings in Amsterdam was the Anne Frank Museum. Yeah. It's unbelievable. The emotion when you go into that place. Hmm? My grandmother was in the resistance in the Second World War was and she? she knew Frank, yes. Yeah. Oh. And, well, that's um, interesting. It's um yeah, my my grandma talked a lot about that time and um one of the things that she told me that the the Jewish people knew that yeah. uh, it might be the last evening, the last few days. Yeah. So at the night, all the lights were out and people would come over the roofs to actually have like little farewell parties. Mm. And um, that that's, was the last time that uh, my grandmom also has actually seen the family Frank. Wow. Oh. So, yeah. <laughs> that, well, it certainly does get to you. It really does. You know, it looks like an ordinary house, and uh, very steep steps in the in the houses in Amsterdam. Ever so steep stairs, but uh, when you go in there, you because it, it hasn't changed. They've got a hell of a lot of the same stuff in there. You know, the furniture or whatever. There's some empty rooms with just pictures. Or writings or whatever on the wall, you know, um, telling you about the place. But it is, it is heart wrenching. Yes, it is. Uh, definitely. Yeah, that, that. There was a cheese market in Amsterdam as well. I remember going to a cheese market. Mm. I don't know um, whether that's still there. Um, I wouldn't know, to be honest, because so much has changed over the years and. To be honest, the last time I went to Amsterdam was actually to take my own children over there, and we haven't mm. seen a cheese market there then. <laughs> oh, no, this was back in the 70s when I used to go, you know, 70s and 80s, because I had to um, uh, I had to work there occasionally. Okay. Yeah. And not in the red light area. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say anything here. <laughs> 
I don't know about that. If anybody has pictures to the contrary, you could send them to info at paukradio.com. I mean, it was just the way you said it, this little hesitation you had from <laughs> making it sound very secretive. I had to go to Amsterdam so now and then. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was one of the places I used to go to. Yeah, <laughs> well, I, I did enjoy Amsterdam. I loved Amsterdam. I loved Rotterdam. And uh, I made quite a few friends out there. Women. <laughs> <laughs> We've been sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, um, I, had a, I had a friend out there called Cora. I've lost touch with her now, but I'd like to get in touch with her again. Anyway, carry on. <laughs> okay, we we can actually get on with the show now, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm uh, just That's making fine. okay, just making sure. Mm-hmm. Didn't know if we wanted to go down memory lane a little bit more or not. No. No. Okay. <laughs> um, so Yvonne. Um, we invited you on the show and, uh, you've written this book called the gray ones, uh, for our listeners who, who may not be, uh, um, familiar with you. Could you just tell us a little bit about yourself and what brought you to write this book? Well, I am obviously, as you've heard Dutch and, um, I grew up in the Netherlands um, as a very terrified and um, very insecure girl, let's say that. Um, I come from a very big family. I've got two brothers and three sisters. And I can remember, actually, the time before I was born. I was actually shown my family. And for a long time, I actually thought it was maybe strange. I always kept it to myself as a memory in the background. And when I grew up, to me, actually seeing spirit was quite normal. Um, spirit of our uh, dead cat, for example, was one I can remember very, very well. Um, I also saw the spirit of a dog, and that is still a little bit in dispute because... Is, it, is this um, the poodle? The poodle, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, yes. The thing is, you know, my theory on this, it has not been explained in the book yet. I let people actually guess a little bit because... This is a memory that has been following along a long time. My mum still remembers me pulling her hand from, come on, mum, you know, there was this dog in your bedroom. Yeah. And when we actually asked what happened to our dog, Bingo, even now today, nobody's really 100% sure because my father told us the story that he went to friends, but we're not so sure about that now. <laughs> so so you, don't, you don't know where the dog actually went then? Well, my father actually, because the dog kept on running running away, and sometimes he was found eating stuff that was not good for him. He was um, a, a purebred dog. He was a poodle. Yeah. And, um, so he he already had quite a few problems because of it. So they arranged for him to, to go to a new house. And mm-hmm. that was friends of my father. And my mother doesn't know their, these friends very well either because it was through my father's business, like... Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, a lot of connections. And so now and then we would ask as kids, like, oh, what happened to Bingo? Is he okay? And my father said, yeah, he's fine. He would show his really old, crappy photo. <laughs> but we're not so sure. We're not so sure if the dog actually lived that old, to be honest. Oh. So it may well be that he indeed died. And if you then actually look back in time, because obviously now we're grown up, you start to put these memories together that are a little bit, well, well that was strange. Yeah. I see that dog, I followed him out, only to find that, you know, the cat was not well, who then actually was found the following day in my friend's garage. Yeah. So he started to put these things together. And, like, I saw the cat running away in spirit. Mm-hmm. But I didn't know in spirit. I thought it was actually quite normal. It was just, you know, one of those things. It's like, hey, that guy's got you, and the neighbours didn't see it. <laughs> yeah. So, also, I saw the... Um, spirit always passing through our house. They would stay, stand near my bed. Um, so it was just a normal human being to me because my eyesight is absolutely terrible. I can't see without my glasses on. So, um, to, so to you, these these things were solid. You, you thought they'd like the cat when it ran out. Know. When you saw it come out of the garage and yeah. the, the body of the cat was actually in the garage and it ran past you. You yeah. thought that was the real cat. And as a child, that's... Because I was shouting, Katja. Yeah. And then 
the neighbours corrected me, no, he's not there, uh, darling, he's in the garage, he's here. But yeah. uh, that's the confusion, but if you think about it, it was four, nearly five years old. So it is something that you as a child don't think about. Yeah, and he, he was throwing up beforehand on the on the doormat, wasn't he? So do you think he could have eaten something that poisoned him, rat poisoning or something? That's, that's what I think, yeah. But then again, I would not have known that. Mm. So these things together was bingo, or the dog, that my mum yeah. thinks did not die early. As well. mm. I still can't get on it, I think he did die. Did he run into the hall to let me know and that way let my mother know that there was something wrong with the cat because these little things all connected together? That's just speculation. Mm. So after all, I could see Aura and he didn't look like the usual cat. It started to change. Mm. But didn't believe me. So, And all, and all I, this, all this, I can tell you, listeners, is in Yvonne's book. Everything's in Yvonne's book. The um, Going back to... Can you explain, did you, you mentioned earlier on about the fact, now I've read all this bit, but uh, you mentioned earlier on about the fact that you saw your parents and your family before you were actually born. Is there any yeah. way that you can just enlighten the listeners on that, how that happened? Um, well, like we all have memories, they all have a different feel to it. And yeah. Um, this was one that has been here my whole life. And then people sometimes go back and talk about happenings that you've done together and nice little cat-togethers. Um, mm -hmm. I remember this little cat-together as well. And But the oddness was obviously when you go and discuss these kind of things, there's not many people who can remember hanging under the ceiling, for example. So these things, the oddities, you learn about them when you grow up, things that are possible and things that are not possible. And when you grow up and you hear people or you join into conversations and you never hear people talking about like uh, odd memories, you start to keep these things for yourself. The same thing like um, when I overheard that my uh, grandfather from other side um, heard voices and ended up in a mental asylum, there's not yeah. something you can share with anybody. So well, they, this happened often, didn't it? Yeah. You know, people were put into mental asylums because they were hearing voices, they were saying things. And in the olden days, when your grandfather was obviously put into a mental asylum, it was the done thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But he also was very strongly religious. He was a very pious man, um, a good Catholic, as they would say. And yeah. um, he was completely dedicated to the church. So I think also, unfortunately, I've never had a chance to talk with this man. And my mum doesn't have many memories of him either because she was still a young girl. She was 14 years old when, uh, when he was uh, taken away. So it's such a shame because it's really a person that you would like to talk to because if he would have, I had to deal with the voices. And to me, they were normal. And I did, I'd never seen them as anything frightening or, um, in fact, they actually saved my life. In, in a way mm -hmm. so I never associated with something bad it only actually became when uh, came about when people actually don't share these kind of um, experiences and then when you overhear mother talking about well your grandfather um, ended up in asylum and that was only a conversation that came forward because the men died that yeah, yeah that you think oh well better don't say anything about this and I keep it to myself yeah not only that, but, you know, people didn't really talk about this sort of thing. Uh, they certainly wouldn't have... To... How old were you when he was in the asylum? Or was um, this before you were born? I've never met a man. He he was uh, put into an asylum before I was born. My mother was 14 years old. Yeah. Well, so... in, those, yeah, in those days, you know, the, your mother was still a child, so... But yeah. it, it's just not talked about, you know, not in front of the children and not in front of people that don't know you personally. And there's you know? a lot of things not spoken about within a family setting because obviously mm. those days were simply different. Um, my parents were both from different religions and that was also not acceptable by the church. So yeah. my family ended up not giving us as kids any kind of religion. They just let us grow up and choose for ourselves. 
and mm. um, my father's belief actually became more like uh, not so much as a hatred to the religion itself but to actually the the establishment the way things were dealt with and he feels really that a lot of people have been let down in those days because yeah. when when my for example my mother's family fell apart uh, with their father taken away who was the main income of the family um, they all were scattered over care homes and my mother was left to look after her mother so there's a lot of things that happened and while well, my grandfather always was donating towards the church played music for the church when it was mm. the other way around they didn't do anything back they just let the family go into poverty so i can understand that there's um bitterness uh, bitterness yeah yeah uh, yeah i can understand that it's kind of, kind of hypocritical with uh, considering all the controversies with the Catholic Church these days and a lot of the abuse that seems to have gone on <clears throat> in the church that's covered what? up. Uh, your, your fa- Sorry, Mark. Your father was Jewish, was he? Who? Ivan? Ivan? No, my father was not Jewish. No, sorry. Oh. No, he wasn't. No, he was Protestant. Oh, um, but they, there is actually connections in the family from my father's side that are suggesting there are Jewish people within the family because my great-grandfather, um, her, his partner uh, was a Jewish refugee from the Second World War. She fled Poland. Oh, um, I see. At, so it is a, a lot of married into uh, family or uh, connections to the family. Mm. So, yeah, and of, mm. obviously... Because of my um, grandmother's involvement in the Second World War, um, there were also connections left over from from there, whatever has. I see. Sorry about that, Mark. Oh, that's Just quite all right. Get that straight. <laughs> <laughs> well, the the voices that you would hear, uh, you heard them ever since you were very little. Yes. Well, the first time, really, very clearly, was when I was drowning, and this. It's really an amazing feeling, really, if you think about it, because I think most people will actually put drowning to um, getting fear, panic. But as soon as I went under, there was no fear. There was just kind of as if I was in a bubble of love, maybe. Um, it was very tranquil, and immediately that that female adult voice told me what to do. And mm. all because I was already learning to swim at um, at nursery school. But I couldn't actually swim with my head above water and obviously it was in the, in the level of a paddling pool kind of thing. So I was able to swim with my head underwater and then I was just taught how to get back to my ring that had slipped out of my hands. And um, it was just before the ring that the um, tranquil sensation actually disappeared. That's when the panic started to come in, but it also made me kick up and go uh, to the surface of the water. And I was right in front of my uh, my inflatable, so I could get hold of that. So that so, was that was, a, that was a pretty traumatic event. Yes, but the thing is, I never had the chance to really think about it because you just deal with the moment. And the voice was for me a positive experience. And it was normal. It saved me. It helped me. It told me what to do. And mm-hmm. I still had to make my own way back somehow. <laughs> you can read about it in my book, how I did this all. But that was really the very first time that I heard a voice. How old and were then, you at that point? So I was around four years old. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so my book really starts from every experience and it starts to build up to well, obviously adulthood, but this is only the first part. And what I've done is actually um, use um, paranormal experiences, occult teachings, philosophies, and I explain um, these kind of philosophies in a, in a very layman's way, in an easy to understand way. And the reason why I do this is also that I would actually like um, young adults, um, kids from 12 years old all the way up to actually able to understand this. Because if you really look into it, what helped me, the voice has saved my life, but my soul has been saved by a silly fiction book, really, that I read when I was 12, 13 years old. Because in the 70s, 
there was nothing about um, learning to understand about um, the sixth sense, about clairvoyance or clairaudience and all these kind of things. So you were very much left on your own um, within a family who didn't really talk about it or my mum was actually pretty scared of certain things. So that book helped me so much and it was a fiction book. Which book it was it? Made- it was by a Dutch um, author, Evert Hartman is his name, and literal translated, it's called The Invisible Light. And it tells about um, a story of a girl who is clairvoyant, but, uh, and, and she sees, obviously, because it's a fiction book, she sees a murder taking place or something. And, um, but she gets help from a, a spiritualist or another man who actually is more um, developed. So he tells her and he teaches her how to protect herself. And um, that's how I started my own protection um, ritual, which was quite interesting. And um, I did a lot of things wrong, but I did one thing right. It uh, took away fear, and I think that was the most important thing. Well, you're, de- you're definitely right that, you know, back in the 70s, there was nothing out there, nothing at all, you know. Even in the libraries, there was hardly anything. You couldn't find nothing on this subject at all. No, not at all. And I grew up in a little village in yeah. those days. So you can really imagine what the, what the libraries there <laughs> would have been like over there. It doesn't exist even anymore, that library. Yeah. Mm. So, yes, my – and I think there's still a lot of um, teenagers who are struggling with um, – mental health is such an issue uh, these days and – when you actually tell people that you hear voices, they immediately think that you've got psychosis or um, multiple personality disorders and, and things like that. But um, it is it is not something that tells me what to do. It actually is more like a, an advice giving way. In the end, I still have to do everything myself. Yeah. So. Well, the the one thing is when people, that whole stigma of you say you hear voices, people automatically think, oh, mental illness. And why do they think that? Because they've been taught to think that way. Yeah. <clears throat> because they're told people shouldn't hear voices. That's not a normal um, behavior. And, you know, and that's where we are with today's society. So there's so much you could call it paranormal types of activities going on around us all the time and we're we're literally programmed to ignore it we're we're told don't ask questions or that's not real that's your imagination oh you've got a mental illness here take some pills um and they they do everything possible to try to get everybody to not pay attention to it to ignore it or to ostracize those people who who do experience it and uh it was terrible for many years and i mean now the now activity is a lot more accepted yet still you go to a normal person or you you know you go to a doctor and say you're hearing voices right away they're going to think it's psychosis yes yeah, so and you've been sent through to uh, maybe a psychologist i've never been to a psychologist to be honest because i learned to deal with it my own way or to me, let's say the, the voices were never the problem and neither were the gray ones or called the gray ones coasts a lot of people will call them co-spirits, you name it. I prefer the word cray ones because even the word ghost has such a stigmatism to it. People will immediately think of something scary. Now, most of the, the ghosts, as I see, are actually really sad. And some of them are not even dead people. They are the, they are the people that fall asleep at night, reliving their childhood trauma somewhere and then go haunting a house where they used to live or where they have been abused. Um, there, are oh, they, there you go, Mark. Yeah. You keep going back to your old house at night. Uh, yeah. Well, I have dreams where mm. I have repeating dreams where I'll go back to my house where I grew up or I'll be back in school uh, or I'll be back working at uh, I used to work at Six Flags Magic Mountain in California, the amusement park. And I'd, you know, those were. Each of those locations have a lot of meaning uh, when they happened, and they still reoccur in dreams. Yes, but maybe sometimes in those dreams, you may you just indeed yeah. visit it in an astral way, and then I yeah. believe it. I believe it does, Yvonne. I really yeah. do believe so, it does. So, if yeah. that's the case, am I scaring the crap out of the current owners? 
That could well be. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're normally asleep about the time you're wandering around in there, I expect. <laughs> I don't know. With the time difference, you know, they, they may be up. It's a few hours behind me Ooh. here, so... They might be watching during the day. There's no difference there. That happens any time, really. It's not always in the spook on the spooky hours. To be honest, most of the um, happenings I find always take place more in the afternoon and the early evenings, and actually, really in the middle of the night or three o'clock or four o'clock in the morning. That's very, very true. That very true. Yeah. So it's uh, so far most of the things that I've seen really actually that I don't need to take my classes off to see if it's a, if it's a, a spirit or not is is during the day. Really yeah. during the <clears throat> time. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, that's very true, you know. I I think a lot of activity happens during the day. It's just that you're not aware of it. Most people are not aware of it because they're busy doing other things or the television's yeah. playing in the background or they're doing the washing or whatever. So, or and, <laughs> yeah, and uh majority of people think that it should happen at night because that's where the television programs are all take place in the dark at night. Because it's yeah, spooky. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> But when I done that filming for that tourist um, um, film that I done for um, for Wales that time, that was during the day, and I got more. I got so much good activity during that day, walking around the old cemeteries. Oh, yeah. that's amazing! Yeah, that's it. oh yeah, cemeteries. Me and cemeteries have something I can choose every time a house, and yeah. somehow I'm uh, living opposite a, a cemetery. Next to cemetery, <laughs> oh, you know, that would, it wouldn't really worry me if I lived next to a cemetery because you know, <laughs> mind you, the house might be a bit busier. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, for me, it doesn't really matter either. I have no problem with it. Obviously, for my husband, it was a little bit different because he had to get used to it. My children are used to it as well. They don't know any better, so it's yeah. It's, uh, to, you know, as far as I'm concerned, it's natural, it's normal. And uh, like you say, with the the hearing part and everything, to me that is normal. But to people that don't understand, obviously, they think you're a loopy. Yes, exactly. Uh, hmm. to, be, to be honest, I now have come out to the world to tell everybody I'm hearing voices and also for my family to actually get this confirmation. It only happened two years ago because yeah. I was... And it's more or less that's when I started to write uh, my book, to be honest. Yeah? And, uh, yeah, well, I've, I've written the whole book, um, <laughs> 100,000 words. And when I finished it, I decided to rewrite the whole thing. Because obviously I let my, I had students uh, at the time, I was doing spiritual development circles and things. And I thought, well, I'll let them read it, see what they think. And then they came back from, we really like those little stories that you tell to explain things. And I thought, hmm. Maybe I should write the whole thing in um, as if it's a fiction book. So you really follow the whole thing. And then, yes, it goes. you have to get used to it, I think, because it goes back and forth in time. So each subject is put together and slowly explains the happenings, but it also will allow you to start um, analysing it yourself and speculate yourself. So you will read my premonitions. And if you mm. like symbolism, you can actually start analysing it yourself. And try yeah. to find meaning is because later on it will be explained, but it will actually put all those little puzzle pieces together the way I had to do throughout my life. And um, it seems to click because um, there's a lot of people at the moment, there's around 100 people in America now that have been, um, that want a copy of my book. So before it actually is uh, officially launched on the 4th of April. It's like um, it's also a bit of a test, and the feedback I get is all like I had to get used to the back and forth. But once they're in it, they understood why I was doing this, and I couldn't stop reading it. And I just finished it doing in one day, <laughs> so <laughs> that is good. <laughs> that is good. That is good. Yeah. yeah, that is good. I like the title. I like the fact that you call them the gray and grays instead of uh, ghosts. Yes, the reason there is. There is a bit of a, um, I suppose it could be a bit of, um, 
the first thing that I had, when I first read the title, I thought, oh, this is going to be about aliens. Yeah, I was going to say, that's the only thing is it's a confusing to anybody, especially in the UFO community, is because uh, yeah. the entities everybody refers to as the greys. So when you see the gray ones, yeah, I, I, originally I thought that's what it was about, too. And then I started reading it, and then I understood that you were hmm. referring to spirits. And... I, I actually like that that um, term much better than ghosts because you're right. You use the word ghosts. Everybody comes right in with their, you know, pre-programmed ideas on ghosts, which are usually all very Victorian uh, laden ideas. And uh, it's not really... Uh, what's going on you as you mentioned too, the fact that you run into what people would think of as a ghost and it's not anybody who's died it's somebody who's still very much alive whether you're yeah. dealing with somebody who's having an out-of-body experience astral traveling um, there's even possibilities of time slips exactly i haven't i would not know about time slips unfortunately but um the reason why i call them craybons is that when they do not connect with you they are the natural color is cray or different shades of cray. But if they connect with you or make a connection, they will appear in color. And that is the difference between the cray ones. So when you do see them in color, know that they are actually connecting with you. And you can also put that to the test. <laughs> so it is, I think, maybe... Um, for example, in my book, I give examples as well from when my children see it and when they describe it. So when they describe it to me in color, I know that they have made a connection. It also actually explains what the difference is between the, the different types of cray ones as such. Because you have those that actually have been crowned. They have not let go of this world yet. And they actually are feeding on us. So that's what makes us feel cold, for example. That means they have made a connection, but in a more negative way. They try to scare you uh, through the negative energy. You actually feed them to maintain their um, astral body that they have not let go of. And these are the kind of differences that I explain. And that's purely based on, um, on putting things to the test, my own experiences. And I explain that by going back in my stories. Why? Oh, sorry, Mark. Well, I, I was. We're probably going to talk about the same thing there. I mean, uh, that explanation you just gave of you know ones who won't give up their bodies and uh, are feeding off of people is actually very similar to the description that I hold to on what we think of as demonic or negative entities. Um, whether they're human and hu mostly human spirits who are causing mischief, causing issues from a very negative standpoint and trying to feed off of other people's energies in order to, uh, to manifest and grow stronger interacting yeah, with our physical world. Yeah. And the problem is, is that the more successful they are, the darker they will appear. So they can actually become, come across really black, completely black. And then you start to actually cross over, are they grounded spirit or are these the entities that people know as shadow people, for example? Mm -hmm. You know, you and are one of the, sorry, Yvonne, you no, are one ahead. of the first people that has just described the way I've see, I see them. The different shades of grey, and like you say, the darker the ones are, the more negative they are. And it's only when your attention is taken to them right you notice them or your attention taken to them then you're able to psychically describe the colors that they're wearing or whatever exactly and, and what <clears throat> they use yeah yeah so, and things about them like my exactly. smelly ghost the other day mark i knew yeah. exactly what that person was what that was all about what it was i described the clothes everything about it didn't i this was your stinky ghost my stinky ghost. Smelly? <laughs> My smelly one. <laughs> Go on, explain. What is this stinky ghost? <laughs> Mark will explain. It's a... Well, it was your stinky ghost. There's, she had a visitor in her house that... Uh, I've got grape in my mouth. Really stunk of B.O. 
He was <laughs> he was passing through. He showed up a couple of different times, and uh, <laughs> his presence was uh, pronounced by an incredible stink of body odor. <laughs> yeah, but every time I saw him, each time, you know, I saw him for the first time and I knew that he wasn't going to be hanging around, that he'd be gone in a couple of hours or he, it was just like he was doing his own thing, but he would move on. When he moved on, I knew which direction he went through the house, which direction he went through the garden, everything about the way he went, right? He just drifted off that direction. A couple of weeks later, the, he was back. He came back. And again, I knew that it was like a stop-off point. He was just having kind of like a psychic rest sort of thing, a ghostly rest, and he would move off in his own time. And within a couple of hours, he did. That's amazing. <laughs> it would be interesting to find out if, if he was somebody who was reliefing a moment or something or on his way to work, who knows? <laughs> oh, I don't know, but I'll tell you one thing. He ponged. He ponged. He really <laughs> are that smell a strong body odor was overwhelming it absolutely filled the room chokingly oh amazing yeah yeah <laughs> but you know like you said it's um the way you describe them is the way i see them you know they could be like a gray gray image going past yeah. you take no notice but as soon as you go oh that was someone went past straight away. You look, and there it is. It's more like, you know, solid form, full, full dress, everything. You know? this, especially when they make a connection. If you can see them the way yeah. they are, in, truly. Even, without... even, yeah, but even making a connection by not talking to them, you know, just being aware that they're there. Boom! It's yeah. like a change comes over them. But it's also because then you start to connect, but they don't yeah. like it that very much because then you drain them as well, especially when you don't show any fear. So you can actually walk into it. If, if I go, for example, on a, on a ghost hunt, I do indeed have to run after them. I have no fear. I have something around me that actually pushes them away because it drains them, and I don't like doing that. So I've only been on a, a, on a few visits to haunted houses where there were problems. And... Mm. Uh, one was in a hotel where people who were female were constantly locked in. Um, and uh, there was this gentleman who died there on his sick bed. And he, he I, th I don't know what he used in those days, but it, it's like, I think, either or ever, how do you call that? To tranquilize? And that yeah. was this kind chloroform? Of, uh, sulfur kind of Ether chloroform? chloroform. Yeah. Yeah, chloroform. Yeah, that's it. And it has a sulfuric kind of smell to it. And that was, I keep talking about this man with his body odor that, was going through. <laughs> yeah, uh, you, you you are. Mark said to me the other day. He said, Irene. He said I've spoken to her, and she's very much like you. You are, because I'm not afraid of them either. No, me at all. But, to no, me, they are just part of normal life. Exactly, and that's why I find it so strange that some of the programs you see, yeah. actually, mediums mm. go into a, an alleged haunted house and then you see them with these shocked wide open eyes actually <laughs> behaving scared and i think that is not going to help the family <laughs> that's just the last thing that you need to teach them is to be scared it, yeah because of exactly the opposite effect and you, you don't have to be scared and this is one of the things that i hope that i've actually written my book so down to earth i question everything i try to actually um, give comparisons from how, for example, things are seen from a scientific point of view and where it cannot be explained anymore from a scientific point of view. And my aim is no longer anymore to prove that the afterlife exists because it does exist. That's where I am coming from. Um, and I'm not going to go out of my way. I like to actually go further and that we, as, um, as people who are aware of this, maybe... Uh I don't think you need to prove it to anyone because they're all going to find it themselves one day. Exactly. So mm. it's, but the thing is, you know, we move so fast these times and science is just brushing ahead with everything and we leave ourselves spiritually behind. And there's a lot of things that we miss out on or misunderstand. And 
one of those things that I will never forget were the stories that came back from um, the people that actually survived the tsunami that many years oh, ago. Yeah. Well, and um, yeah. the sightings of, of still tourists uh, playing in the sea who had died mm -hmm. there. And for, for the native people, they were so much more in tune with their spirituality and how to deal to actually put those souls to rest. And then yeah. the stories are correct that most of the people that actually were still haunting the beaches were the Western people because we've, we've lost our spirituality in so many ways. People are moving away from the churches. Um, it's, everything has to become so explained by science. And there's a lot that cannot be explained by science that actually uh, helps us to, when we do die, to actually come to some kind of acceptance. But all we do is just try to prolong as much as possible while sometimes you just need to let go. You know, it's, um, and not to be scared of it because we do not die. We just move on, we evolve. And I think we sometimes need to look a little bit back from how people in the past thought about these things and why we did certain kind of rituals. When you now go to um, uh, a funeral service, so many people don't use fresh flowers anymore or live flames that put plastic flowers up and everything has to be done so quick and it becomes so impersonal. It's, and these are all little things that actually help to, for, for um, a spirit to move on, to actually help your loved one to depart. And, but I think so many get grounded and I think this will only increase because we move away from the rituals and we don't do the things anymore, which was normal, which was came naturally to us. And that's what I find a pity. And I think yes. we will get more hauntings and, and, and more problems because one of the things that you see a lot is the um, mm. sleep paralysis. Yeah. I don't know how it is in England these days, but ever since I moved to the Netherlands, there's a lot of teenagers who complain about sleep paralysis. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> Obviously, you have the scientific explanation. Mm -hmm. You also have the, um, the paranormal explanation. Well, this is it. You know, you've got the scientific explanation. The youngest person I ever uh, tried to help that suffered with sleep paralysis was five years old. Five years old. And this child was talking about the old witch woman that stood by her, the old woman that stood by her bed where well, you've got the hag syndrome yeah mm, the old hag syndrome oh, this is a five-year-old child that hardly knew what was uh uh cinderella from bloom and snow white you know i doubt if she'd even got to that age stage in her life where yeah. she was watching the walt disney films but almost all of them will, will actually tell you that they have seen somebody in the room. Yeah. Or somebody's giving pressure on their chest. Right. That's and right. this is and this is all actually um, when that happens, you, you release fear. And what do grounded spirits need need to actually maintain the astral body that they don't want to let go of? Mm -hmm. They need energy. So you get a little bit of a circle. So I'm, I'm working with a few uh, Dutch teenagers who are suffering with sleep paralysis and we do some kind of um, um, techniques like visualization techniques to give them protection, some little yeah. protection things. And it works, but it works so well that whatever is trying to get that energy is um, attacking them now during the day. So there is more going on. Well, I will say from as someone who has experienced um, sleep paralysis firsthand, uh, the scientific explanation is total crap. It's, yes. <laughs> I didn't want to say that. <laughs> I don't mind saying it. It's total crap. First of all, it's never been proven. It's it's a guess. And the idea, they say, well, sleep paralysis is caused by the brain releasing a chemical to keep you from moving around while you're asleep. Uh, well, you're you know what? My old man that. Yeah, I know. We toss and turn in our sleep all the time. People sleepwalk. I watch my, my old dog here, who 14 year, 13-year-old dog, He's dreaming all the time.
time and his legs are kicking as he's chasing bunnies in his dreams. You, you know, so we all move in our dreams. Uh, we all move when we're asleep. But, you know, the paralysis that I experienced, I was awake. And yeah. there was, I well, uh, this, the, the one I experienced, and it was about four or five times I experienced it in this one house. It was only in this one house that I lived in uh, 19 years ago. And um, never happened before or since, and I never did see a figure, but I but I always felt a presence in that house, and uh, that's what got me into the paranormal to begin with. Is uh, the house had activity, and I would wake up and I'd feel this more of an energy pressure than like hands or anything on me feeling that pressing me down in my stomach. I couldn't move. I was paralyzed. I couldn't speak, but I could think. And again, I wasn't afraid. I would, I kind of knew what was going on and I was trying to communicate with whatever was there. And it never really directly communicated back to me, although sometimes the pressure increased. And then when it did, I would like say, okay, that's enough. You're out of here. <laughs> and mentally put up my blocks to um, push it away. Uh, and after a few minutes, it would it would just dissipate and go away. And then, you know, you would think, oh, if if, if uh, most people, you think they would just jump up or be scared or run around. It's like, not me. I went right back to sleep. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's the best way. <laughs> yeah. It reminds me of, of going on holiday to Scotland. Uh, my husband had arranged um, a nice bed and breakfast and uh, I went with the kids and I took my mum and a niece along and um, we actually more or less occupied this whole bed and breakfast all the rooms were ours so my boys uh, shared the bedroom with me and my husband uh, my mum sh shared with one of my daughters and um, the other three went into a bedroom uh, together so we were all occupying this whole old Georgian style I think it was this this bed and breakfast and um, it started actually that we heard like um, children footsteps running up and down the stairs. And the funny thing is when you're so used to it and you're so tired after your journey, it was really hard going to sleep until my son said, mum, mum, there's this woman standing here in a room. And my husband said, Yvonne, Yvonne. And I look and I see this woman standing there in a nice long nighty. And I said, oh, she won't do anything. I turn around and I just go back to sleep. <laughs> But the thing is, is that my husband is not as used to these kind of things. And, um, but I think when I don't show any fear or um, just get on with it, then it, it, it becomes normal. It's, it's not a problem anymore. And that's also how I raised my own children. And when they see things, they say, it's okay. It's, it's okay. They're not going to do anything to you. And often they don't even, they're not even aware that you are there. So sometimes they're so enclosed in their own bubble, their own time bubble that they're um, stuck in they won't do anything so you talking about that just reminded me of something with my father many many years ago he used to work on the steam trains and uh, on the footplate uh, shoveling the coal in and one thing or another and he worked out of a place um i don't know where you know it chichester Oh, yes, yeah. Yeah, he worked out of Chichester, and uh, he had lodgings there. And this, when he took these lodgings, Mark, this old landlady said to him, when it's the full moon, you must not come out of your room. Do not open the door. Right? <laughs> and he laughed at it. He thought, oh, yeah, yeah, werewolves, this, that, and the other. Anyway, the first full moon came along, and he woke up choking with somebody's hands around his throat. Oh. Yeah. yeah. And he's stressed blind that that really happened. Something was choking him, literally choking him, uh, strangling him. Yeah. He couldn't see anything, but it was strangling him. Oh. That makes you really wonder what has happened over there when it was full moon, that this yeah. is, like, happening over and over again. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. it makes me, it, it's it's those kind of things, and, and for me, I agree with you, it's, it's not so much about proving the afterlife exists. Well, there's existence, 
uh, definitely beyond this life. But what for me, it's more of understanding how it works. And yeah. in the, in those situations when you're dealing with you waking up and choking, what are you dealing with? Are you dealing with a human spirit who's angry for some reason, is physically able to manifest like they're choking you is it some other type of experience is it a psychic experience where maybe you're connecting into somebody else who was choked to death and you're yeah. reliving that moment um are you dealing with non-human entities of some kind uh, it's these are the things that i'm more interested in trying to figure out rather than just the blanket oh yeah is there life after what happens when we die so when I listen to that story, obviously it's something to really investigate is by trying to experience it yourself. It's not really a nice experience, I think, to go and go over there by full moon and get choked. But the first thing mm. that stands out for me, it's full moon. Now, what happens when there's full moon? It has a, a serious effect on, on the rise of the sea, for example. It has an effect on our water. It's, uh, it seems to be a proven thing. Also, our emotions. Yeah. Um, Water is also symbolic for our emotions, and they always are heightened at full moon. Mm -hmm. Even so much that when it's full moon, from what I understand from uh, some people that I knew that worked in the police force, that they always prepared that when it was full moon that it would be busier than normal. People would be quicker to get drunk or louder or more aggressive, easy to get into fights. That's so true. That is very, very true. Well, you, you know... So I've I've thought about that for a long time, and and the one thing that I started to realize, I would I from a scientific point of view, because I'm also like an astronomy space kind of geek. So, you know, the one side of it I look at: what difference would it make if the moon is fully lit up by the sun, or half lit up, or whatever? That would cause effects here. But you know, if you take away the light aspect, you know, first of all, yeah, when you have a full moon, it lights up the night like day and that can mess with some people's psych psyche uh, and some animals and how they react and and whatnot but you just also mentioned something that's very important the tides and we have the gravitational forces when the moon is full it's behind the earth and the magnetic uh pull gravitational pull of the moon is on us in one direction and we have the sun directly on the other side in another direction so you've got this gravitational pull being affected on the planet from two sources one very close one far away but they still affect us and i think that has in itself an effect on people and and a lot of different um psyche uh, rather than just the light of the moon itself. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So when somebody's mentioning that uh, a certain occurrence repeats every time and it's full moon, um, what I do know for sure is that uh, the grounded, as well as the what I call the enlightened spirits, because when they manifest, there is a certain moist level necessary. Water is very important, especially still water or damp kind of things for things to happen so if there's full moon and there is this kind of um pool that actually seems to also affect how water is moving in its form in damp or whatever who knows what that will have effect on whatever kind of residue that might be in that room well is it indeed from again is it indeed somebody reliving an experience from the residue, because obviously when we run along, our body sweats. Yeah. But when we deal with emotions, we also, let's say, spiritually sweat. We actually throw this energy yeah. around. It could be positive, it could be negative. But it is like a tape record. It is like little memories that we throw around. And the more heightened our emotions are from an experience that we have, positive or negative, we leave a mark on the place. And if that is not being cleaned up, then it will stay there. It will be absorbed within the walls, especially if walls are the Victorian style when they used hair and whatever kind of is lime or something, those kind of special type of walls. I'm not an architect, so I won't know. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. Li uh, limestone. Really cool. Limestone is a conductor of exactly. energy. Water is an excellent conductor of electricity. 
And exactly. but and while that's a scientific fact, water, if it can conduct electricity, what other types of energies can it conduct? You know, limestone, quartz, crystals. You know, we we look at crystals. I mean, we use crystals in in transistors. You know, we they use crystals in electronic technology because of the way that it conducts electricity and channels it and, and vibrates at a certain frequencies. So, if it could do this with electricity, imagine what it does with other forms of energy. Yeah, exactly. And because you know, we don't read. I, I like to look into these things like. Uh, from a scientific way, but unfortunately, um, it is a kind of world or a kind of um, uh, system that we have not developed anything proper for as yet. But it doesn't because we haven't got that yet. Doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It, so exactly, it's one of those, yeah. Well, and and that's I think what I find one of the most important thing is is like write our experience down, be down to earth, be truthful about it. If you make mistakes, make mistakes. If you speculate, you speculate. And um, maybe about certain things I could be completely wrong, but I purely actually write these things down and put my um, perspective on it because I've, I live with it every day. And one thing I have is an analytical brain that wants to try and understand why is this happening to me and why is this happening to that person or why are things running this way. So I needed to find out. I was searching and searching and um, I'm not the person who would put a label on me. I never felt comfortable. I've, I've, I've been with the spiritualist church. I've worked into the occult. I've worked into all sorts of different societies. I was looking into maybe joining... Um, one of those societies that, uh, like the Stella Matutina, for example, um, Paul and Dawn, these kind of things. But then you have to swear an oath of secrecy. And, and I thought, yeah, but I don't want to keep this thing for myself. I want to share it out. and <laughs> Because I'm sure I'm not alone, you see. Yeah. So, that's the way I feel. We have enough secret societies. Thank you very much. It's time for people. Yeah. People have lived in darkness and stupidity for too long. And no, when people, exactly. when when the groups withhold knowledge, there it's 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 a power grab. They have something yeah. over everybody else. They don't want. They keep it to ourselves because we don't want to share it. Well, that's greed. Um, as in the human race, definitely needs to learn. A lot of this now, especially now when things are just the world seems to be falling apart at the seams. Everyone is so crazy at the moment. And yeah. uh, I think a lot of that has to do with where we we're reaching that boiling point of you can only keep people in the dark and keep people in certain philosophies for th that false philosophies for so long that that, you know, I think the spirit starts to rebel. Yes, no, not just the spirits. I think, I think it has also um, the reason why. I don't know if you've noticed it, but there seems to be more people reporting that they see shadow people, and there's all these speculations from who are these shadow shadow people. You name it. Um, as far as I'm concerned, there is a connection there. We are making because if you actually look back in time, and um, I'm not a religious person, but uh, I did read the Bible, I did study the Abrahamic religions, but also comparative religions, so tribal, you name it. And what I found in the Quran, they talk about the jinn, uh, the very first people that were ever created before human beings came along like we are, mm -hmm. and they were made out of the smoke of fire, and they were black, <laughs> and had red eyes, and those are the jinn. Now, that is something that you can find, for example, in the Quran. <clears throat> And that it would be one explanation for, for them. But they are like um, in some kind of, um, how you can, like a twilight world. They're half within our material world and half within the astral. And if everything that's affecting our material world also will have an effect on the astral and also on these creatures, they have not disappeared. So there is a knowledge about them. So what if the shadow people are the jinn? And they are popping up or seem to pop up more. And um, if that is the case, this is just one theory that I'm trying to um, hunt for now. And uh, But another interesting 
um, theory or that um, because I am researching this part is while I spoke to one um, to the boyfriend of my niece, he um, comes from a Rosicrucian background, and that is also very interesting to talk with a person like that. So you learn again from a completely different perspective something. But they went on holiday um, to Croatia. And um, he had never heard of the gin or anything like that. So he was a bit skeptical about it. And they visited a very little church over there. And only recently they had discovered that there was a wall painting uh, on that church. And the reason that they never knew is because the whole wall was black with soot from all the candles that had been burned over there for centuries. So they had mm-hmm. cleaned it. And what they found were images of black angels with red eyes. And the tour guide told them that these are angels. So has anybody ever heard of black angels with red eyes? But they were depicted in that church, in that painting. Hello? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) No, I was well taken with that. I'd like to know where that is. Yeah, I will have have to ask the name again. (laughs) And then we're not to make photos because it is so old so it's um but it's something a a line that i'm pursuing and um what i am investigating black angels with red eyes black angels with red eyes yeah well you know you say that to somebody these days they right away think demons demons yes red eyes demons demons but you know Eh. Um, very, very interesting. You know, one of the things that we've talked about a lot is throughout cultures all over the world, there are tales of otherworldly um, types of creatures that we supposedly share this planet with. And I think the the Islamic uh, explanation of the jinn is one take of these types of entities that you can find in cultures everywhere in the UK in in Ireland you know they have the fae or the shay uh celtic fairy lore they in Iceland landic elves and the cherokee people uh in um here in the US talk about the little people um and so different different types of entities that are kind of human-like, but they have those spiritual qualities, paranormal qualities to them, and we share the planet with them. Uh, yeah. I'm, and, and again, I, I mention this all the time uh, on this program. It's like some of the investigations that I have done over here um, have turned out to be you know, not ghosts, but something else, which I personally feel is related to these other types of entities uh, whether you call them elementals nature spirits fae trolls uh, you know elves whatever you want jinn it all is related yes they all connect it but the only difference is as well that for example when you talk about ghosts or like i prefer to call them the great people because i think it's a kind of name and it also may be actually when you, when you can actually create people with maybe aliens, it actually, to me, it's just um, a different form of living. It's um, like, a, for example, explained to my little girl as well that our bodies are more like a, a car. It's a vehicle. It's something we drive. We only just borrow it for the time being. And like a car, for example, needs a tire being replaced or something that's comparable to us old age. We wear out and then we just let go of it and need to move on to another one, for example. But it doesn't mean that we die. We just change the car kind of thing. You well, know? Uh, that's how I look at it. Well, when I change but, my car next time, can I request a Ferrari? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I want one too. <laughs> I mean, right now it feels like I'm driving a Kia. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I want a more athletic one as well next time. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> but that's a good way of putting it, though. You know, you've usually got the, a lot of people put the butterfly and the caterpillar. Um, uh, do you know what I mean? My, my, yes. my mind's gone. Well, yeah, that's... The transformation. I, yeah, yeah. You know. Oh, sugar plum fairies. It's this headache I've got. Sorry about this. 
Yeah, and she's referring to me probably there. Anyway. <laughs> well, the caterpillar. <laughs> no, the headache. <laughs> the headache. <laughs> no, I just lost it there. I totally no, lost you're, you're, yeah, the what cri- I was going to say. No, I understand. Yeah, the concept you were talking about, the chrysalis, yeah. the transformation That's, of yeah. from caterpillar to butterfly, moth, moth yeah. to... Uh, caterpillar to moth and you know it's a it's a i like the car one better though yeah the car one i like the trading up you know give me the v8 <laughs> uh well we create enough spare parts so we can actually go on a little bit longer in our vehicles but <laughs> yeah yeah well i want to if it's going to be in the future it has to be like back the future i want my freaking flying car <laughs> yes. That would be nice. <laughs> well, you know, in a way, we do fly. Uh, in, we fly in our dreams. We fly in, in astrally. And again, it's it's part of what we mentioned earlier in the program is we're programmed. It's all programmed out of us to ignore. And we don't, we don't believe in these things. We believe in the waking physical world. When our dream world, and a lot of cultures uh, look at uh, the dream world as being almost more real than this waking world. Yes, and it's it's a really unnatural thing to do because um, the only thing that actually separates us from any other living entity is is that we cannot accept um, um, death or illness as such. Because if you look at the the animal world, um, for example, I had a cat whose kittens were not healthy and this is i think the most horrible thing that she did when you actually look at these cuties she smothered them all and that is a cat's natural instinct and the reason why she did this is because they all had problems none of them could drink they all had problems with their mouths so instead of actually letting her litter suffer she killed them and and that is something that in the natural world still takes place it's survival of the fittest but we have and, and, and a cat will or, or any other animal they will grieve just as much because if if a young has been taken away that was healthy they will try to protect it or they will try to find it but they also have this kind of acceptance this kind of coming to terms with what has happened to them and they move on quicker than we do but we are trying to hold on so much and um that we actually fear to let go because we're so scared that this is our one and only life Mm -hmm. that all we are doing is trying to find all these kind of things to prolong our life and to be honest do i really want to live to 120 130 i'd rather have ferrari of the body in my next life (laughs) so (laughs) yeah i I, think that my time comes to rather let go (laughs) you know there's an age-old dream of mankind to achieve immortality Uh, i've never i've never of youth I've never understood it because you know what? I perfectly accept the fact that this is all temporary. I'm here for my time and then I'm going to check out. What in the hell would I want to live 5,000 years for? Okay. I'd rather like check out for a while and then come back and go, okay, what's changed? What, 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 what can I do now? And uh, rather than one continuously long existence of just now, again, that's also looking at from the mankind point of view of linear time, which is we've learned is is an illusion to all times happening at once past, present, future. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we in, in that aspect, we are already immortal beings. You know, we're we're spiritual entities having a living physical human experience the lydia time is very western though because from what i understand is that the natives the native americans have this kind of circular kind of thing they have a completely different concept about it from what i understand well, they, they um, many of the Native American cultures, and again, I say many of not wanting to broad brush, because each, each of the tribes and have, their, have their own cosmology, mythologies, and religious point of views. But um, a lot of them do look at white man's time as they just shake their head, like, leave it, leave it to the white man to come up with a way to measure, you know, passing of time. When time just happens, it's around us. Uh, a lot of cultures, like the uh, the Navajo um, in 
the southwestern United States. They have a, a you know, you just show up when you're going to show up. You don't say, okay, be, everybody be here at 8 o'clock. Well, they'll come when they're going to come. Uh, okay. You show up at somebody's house. You don't go knock on the door and rudely interrupt <clears throat> them. You wait outside. And eventually, they'll figure out you're there. You know, <laughs> they'll see you and figure out you're there, and then they'll invite you in. That's just really, you know, it reminds me a little bit of the scene out of The Hobbit from Tolkien, that all these dwarfs come into his uh, yeah. little house. Have you seen that film? <laughs> yes. And the, um, you know, again, it's like things will happen in their own time. And, you know, the white man, I've heard, there was a line in the film, Thunderheart, which I've always loved. So white man's time will give you stomach cancer. And it's true because you're constantly, we, in our Western society, we are ruled by time. We're ruled by our little watches going around or flashing digital numbers at us. And we know we got to do this by this point. We got to go this year and go there and we got to do this. And oh my God, what about this? We got to pay the mortgage. We got to do this. And everything we freak out about hitting those time periods, those time marks to the fact that, yeah, it causes us so much stress where a lot of Aboriginal cultures, they think we're crazy. And you know what? They're right. I think so, too. I think they, they're really onto something here that we completely miss out on. We um, add so much stress to our lives and everything is so regimented. Um and it's so based in the physical, and this is one of the things that really gets me these days is we're so based in the physical that we we ignore the spiritual. Even even very religious people, they're still caught in the same trap. Oh, I believe in God. I, I, I go to church every day. I believe in Jesus or Buddha or whatever. And yet they still follow the same patterns. I mean, we're kind of stuck. It's kind of a trap. Because we have to wake up and be at work on time every day. You can't work on Indian time. <laughs> You'll get fired. <laughs> yeah. And uh, or you or, or you got to pay your mortgage on time. And but again, it just puts so much stress on our minds and on our spirits that uh, it wouldn't surprise me if that's where a lot of cancer comes from. Yes, I think that stress is. I think one of the main reasons for it. It's just. It has such a, a huge impact on our, well, on our astral body. They actually say body, mind, and spirit are all one. Um, but I have a theory that it is our emotional side that actually creates. And I think that actually causes quite a few problems because we may actually look at our physical well-being, but so much is actually forgotten from what actually is going on within our astral body. We, we actually automatically assume that our astral bodies are perfect because it is made out of something spiritual. We don't know exactly what it's made out because we haven't got the tools to measure it or analyze it or dissect it, which you would do with a, um, a material body. It's all speculation and trial and error and people over the centuries coming with theories that they try out. But what I do see is that um, when people are scared or afraid that pull their aura in um, sometimes when they get out of a, a, a scary situation or a time of stress they let their aura release again but it doesn't always fit anymore in their body so certain areas of the body don't get the energy anymore that they normally would have um, so people actually almost roll up all the way up and they're just it's like as if they're hanging slightly above the head that they have no crowning at all anymore but yes, I'm lucky to see Aura, and I don't always understand what I'm seeing because I have nobody really to talk to or to compare it with. Because when I open a book, it's not always certain things I can follow, I can relate to it. But there's nobody apart from my own daughter now <laughs> that I have something to compare with. That do you see it the same way as I see it? And then we make notes and we analyze things together. And then we are now trying to work out from what works, what isn't, is this only. For example, I know when people are lying, they have like, for me, I see all these little orange dots around their heads. And it's really nice to see that my youngest daughter actually sees the same thing. So we can agree upon something. But I would like to hear or come in touch with people who have similar experiences because then we can work on something and maybe we can start analysing these kind of things. And I do believe indeed that if 
people are so stressed and are not really energizing certain parts of their body, then then you start to create problems such as cancer or any other kind of weird growth or disease. Now, when you see auras, and I, I've talked to people who, who, who have said they could see auras in the past, um, how does it usually appear to you, or are you able to describe it at all? Uh, is, are you seeing a lot of colors? Are you seeing like just like an outline of somebody, or does it extend you know, fairly far beyond somebody's body? And is it a situation where you have to concentrate on someone to see their aura? Or do, if you're walking down the street, you could see like 20 people and all their auras are spiking up? Yes, I see it all the time, so I don't know any better. And um, it's only, again, when you grow up and you notice that people don't see things the same way that you do or respond the same way that you do to people. Um, how do I see them? The same way, I see them with my, with my third eye. That's the only way I can explain it because it's um, blurred. The same way I see uh, ghosts when I see them with my third eye, the grey ones, I see them blurred. So when I was... Um, a child, it took a long time for my family or even my school to realise that I couldn't see a thing. And I was always sitting in front of the blackboard and having to squint and try to make notes and things. So I was around eight, nine years old before I finally had my first pair of classes. And then a whole new world opened up for me because the people who had a material body, they were sharp, but the grey ones were blurred and the aura remained blurred. <laughs> So it is like, um, how can I say it? It's like a shimmering, if I describe it. It's like um, when somebody lies and it is new, it becomes like little orange specks that come out. Um, you can actually see when people are um, concentrating on something, it like peeks out from around their head. Um, like little sparks. It sparks, and, but there's always colour and it changes all the time. It changes yeah. all the time. So you, you people, when they're thinking, it's like a, a whirlpool of emotions that is being expressed in colour. Uh, when they're excited, when they're uh, scared, when they're happy, when mm -hmm. they're extremely sexually active, <laughs> and they also show a lot of orange. Uh, well, <laughs> not in this house, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> don't, get sexu don't get sexually active in my house. <laughs> well, I don't know when uh, when Gertie Pickle, comes in Pickle's this season. Does. Yeah, give pickles with his uh, ball. Yeah, with his red ball. He's always bonking his red ball. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, here's something. I, I've heard a little bit about this before. Have you, in your ability to see someone's auras, have you ever noticed uh, a difference in someone's aura that helps you... Um, understand if that person maybe has some type of uh, mental or emotional illness, like, say, uh, uh, someone who uh, is psychotic or um, so a, psych a psychopath or sociopath, you know, because they process things very differently than uh, a, a regular person would. And would their auras be be spiking and much differently to a point where you could tell that that person has something wrong with them? Yes. Yeah, you do see patterns. Um, it's quite interesting because obviously I'm, I'm working on part two and my husband has post-traumatic stress disorder. And um, my grandfather, from my father's side, um, also had this, and I do actually talk about it in the first book, that he changes and there is no love coming. His, like, his, like his heart has iced over. There are holes and gaps. Is almost um, like little snippets have been ripped out of him and, and, and put behind him or to the side of him. It's not aligned anymore. And my husband, to a certain extent, has exactly the same. Um the only thing is that I can describe is when it happens to my husband, when he goes into um, one of those episodes, is that his heart is really very hard trying to reach out to overcome it. It's almost as, as if like there's a block coming over it. And I, I do believe, and this is also what I am describing in my book, that um, when we go through a traumatic event, 
um, or how we actually are preparing ourselves for our new life before we become um, get into another body, that we create ourselves by using our emotional energy, pure emotion. How? I don't know. The only thing is it's when people are actually um, extremely heightened in their feelings or experiences, they create a kind of almost like as if part of them is being separated that they can actually put away like a little box that they hide that part in. So, for example, when my husband goes into an episode, he can refer back to an eight-year-old child, for example, or he's back to um, uh, the Marine that he was who fought in the Falklands and had to separate part of himself and deal with in a way that he in normal life wouldn't do. And that is another box or like a kind of personality that has almost like um, thrown aside to help him to cope and that he can tap into when he comes into a situation that reminds him or feels similar and then he taps into that and that brings it forward. So, yes, you can see uh, problems in people and you can also, the only thing is that I describe in my first book as well is that um, when you can see people that have love within themselves it doesn't always mean that it will be directed to you. So you can make easy mistakes like that. You trust everybody. And that is very painful. It's a learning curve. Huge learning curve. Which is why we're here. <laughs> yeah. Is to learn. <laughs> Welcome to school, boys and girls. We never stop learning. <laughs> no. Pack a lunch. <laughs> yeah. Um, let me ask you with your experiences and memories now you mentioned in your book um and 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 as i've mentioned i i've read the first part of your book i haven't had a chance to read the rest which i'm definitely going to which by the way as a reminder for everybody it's called the gray ones written by yvonne j smith so you should uh that is going to be coming out in april yeah in april so look for well, that i thought it was already out because it's on amazon it is for pre-sale, yes. The ebook is, yeah. Hmm. Um, the in the early part of your book, you mentioned, and Irene brought it up too, about having that memory of visiting your family, being shown your family, and a very specific scene with your family before you were born. And yeah. do you have any other memories of? life either before you were born or or as like memories of either like spiritual journey astral traveling to the other side um when you read further in my book you will um probably come across my premonitions and you probably will find it interesting that these premonitions are all like cray and uh, they don't just happen while i'm sleeping they also happen during the day and it is the premonitions that really make me scared. That was something so terrifying because it was predictive. Um, that, I think, is astral travel. That you go to um, your, your spirit with a link to your body is being whisked away to being taught or being shown something within this um, well parallel world. I can only describe it. So there is a link there. But if you actually look at my uh, pre-birth introduction to my family, I remember that there was this dark, really dark black kind of vortex that was in that ceiling, which to me, if I, if I remember that feeling, was very normal. It didn't bother me. I was just not so sure about the woman who was standing there calling me. I rather wanted to go back to where I came from. But also, if you actually start to analyse that scene, and that I think would make it so fun to actually have these kind of memories and the explanations, because you can analyse these things as well, because it doesn't make much sense when you look about it, because my brother is older than me, but in my uh, pre-birth memory when I was being introduced, I was older than my brother. I was right in between the two of them. So I was there as a young girl who probably was around six or seven years old. 
that makes me think that I must have in a previous life died as a child that has been whisked away then to start a new life, to live out my astral age. Because that astral body also has a time frame, let's say maybe 120 years, who knows. That is the theory that they say it might be 120 years, but I don't know if we have to live that way. So maybe I might live six years shorter in this life. Um, but I also have very strong feelings that, and I suggest that later on in my book, book because my daughter, who's just as curious and nosy, she investigates everything and she comes across people talking about um, their past lives and she asks if I can remember one. Now, I know for a fact that in one of my uh, lives I was a man and it's, it's really quite funny because when I, for example, grew up as a child, I never saw myself different from a boy or a girl. I felt equal and I've always felt equal, even now. Uh, when it comes from uh, my spiritual side, there is no deficient from why should we be superior or inferior to the other sex kind of thing. Um, yes, there are some other memories I have that I have not uh, written about as yet. <laughs> that will come. Um, That's interesting. It's not been revealed yet to my family, let's say, or spoken about. And um, it's bit by bit, I think, my, because obviously there's a lot of things in my family. Um, I've got a, my brother, Andrew. He also has experiences. And um, now that I'm back in the Netherlands, we speak a bit more often again because we can visit one another. And he's also always asking questions. And he asked did, me. When he, did he um, tell you anything about when he was a child? Um, experiences. Well, he, he was the first one who actually started to talk about the shadow people with me. Oh. And that, that, that was one of the experiences that he sees. Um, something very quickly rushing from the corner of his eyes and he associates it um, with death to be honest so um, like I said I'm, this is a red line that will come through my books while I'm investigating this and all the findings I have mm -hmm. so it's it's not just me it does run in the family um, and that is something that um, by talking about it because in the past we never spoke about it and a bit by bit over the years, more and more of my family members start to, to talk about their own experiences, about seeing indeed ghosts and moving house several times, thinking it was in the house and it didn't really matter if they were living in a new built house somewhere. It just passed through, is what one of my aunties said. So yeah. it's that point in house for it. It's it's not always associated with the house that you live in. Like so, my smelly ghost. <laughs> yeah, just passing through. <laughs> well, sometimes uh, another idea I've had about shadow people is I'm wondering mm. if that might be some type of time or dimensional loop thing. Um, where if you're seeing sh a shadow person, you're seeing maybe a real person in a parallel reality. And that's the only way you could you could make them out is see them as like a dark silhouette rather than as the full person. So we call that a shadow person. Yeah, well, but they, then, move, they move very quick, don't they? They move very, very yeah, fast. They want to interact, you see. Then I think if it's something, that kind of theory, but I know for a fact that they do interact. And um, when you actually see them, shadow shadow is really a very bad terminology for them because they are anything but like a shadow they are so solid dark deep black it's um you can't see through them and um they are um in my classes on sharp so to me that means they are alive they are not seen with my sixth eye they're there they're physically there and the energy that they give off is just tremendous and um in my book you will find when you go further is a scene that me and my son both, um, it was my son who saw it first in our garden. And uh, I'm very down to earth when it comes to things. I was far too engrossed playing my stupid game on the phone while my son said, Mom, Mom, there's a man in the garden. Look over there. And he was, and it's not so much like, a, he's not scared of ghosts, you see, because that's normal. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, 
men, a very tall men in your car. And I said, oh, no, it's the cat who goes out because our, um, we've got like these security lights that come on with movement. And uh, I said, no, it's the cat. I just let him out. He's probably gone into the shed. So no, no, the cat is in front of the window. And he was all panicking. He walked over to me and he pointed and the lights in the garden were still on. And I see the cat sitting in front of our uh, garden doors and I shove it open to let him in. And my son <laughs> shouts, he's now there under the tree. And I look towards the tree and then this huge, tall, really like solid black person. It's like a light absorbing. Nothing reflects on it and just shot from the right to the left and went straight through the fence of my neighbors uh, as if it wasn't there. But the energy that I gave off, it was, you know, you always hear people talk, it's draining. No, this was energizing. It was, honestly, I felt so alive, really alive. And um, this was not one that had red eyes. That's another thing you hear people say about seeing shadow people with red eyes. This one had no eyes at all. It was just huge, tall, solid black. It was amazing. That's all I can say. Was it wearing a hat? They're blacker than black, Mark. You can put them against a black wall and you'll still see them. You still see them that black. Yeah. I I, I asked about the hat because I know a lot of people who have seen these black shadow or these black figures report them wearing what looks like an old style fedora hat at times. No, this one didn't have a hat. This one was more like a, like a, a monk's cloak kind of thing, you know, like cloaked. And I think actually that solidness must be some kind of cloak. It was, and the energy, I also do not think that these are, if they are the djinn, these are not the djinn, this is something different. So, like I said, the quest goes on, and there's more um, things in my book, which I won't say now. <laughs> you have to read it. <laughs> yeah. Don't want to give away too like, much. I'm not going to give away too much. There's far more to come, and this book really is the foundation to help people who never, ever knew anything about all these kind of things that we've been talking about to, find a found- to set a foundation for what is to come. Because the part of the maiden, maiden is actually the learning stage. So you actually learn together. And and the pun is also a little bit because obviously my daughters are young girls. And yeah. I'm walking, like, like I said, I'm going more towards the crone side now. <laughs> well, well that, that's actually a very old concept. From the from the uh, female perspective, the divine feminine, the the what is it, uh, maiden mother crone? Yes. The, yeah. uh, it, it it in itself is its own like a trinity kind of like body, um, father, son, Holy Spirit, uh, mind, body, and spirit, maiden, mother, crone. It's like a three stages. Where am I now, then, Mark? <laughs> <laughs> Would you like now. to know? No. <laughs> it, what What's beyond crone? <laughs> ah, good question. Yeah, yeah. Good question. Oh. That's the same, and I do I do give an answer to that. <laughs> oh, <Okay>. it's my book. <laughs> well, you know what's funny is I I, I heard there was an another. Um, Another co- person I, I I had read their books and they talked about the maiden mother crone concept, and you know again it's part of the feminine side, the female side where the men don't have that. We have like perpetual immature child and then old age death. <laughs> yeah. So so like here I'm in my mid fifties and you know what I'm still that you know bratty kid. I- you're joking. Never grow up. <laughs> it's it's really, I have to look at it from a symbolic side. And the reason why it has given a feminine aspect is because it's related to the phases of the moon and the stages of the moon and how it influences us. So it's it has to do with um, the underworld. So when you actually go through the dark side of the moon is comparison to the underworld, where we prepare ourselves to be reborn again and then you get the maiden stage so it's actually the cycle of life that is actually really been symbolized so why is it the feminine aspect 
Well, it has to do with giving birth, really. I was going because, to say it's that creation of life, yeah, recycling of life, cycle of life, and that that is associated with the feminine aspect. But then you also, of course, have the male aspect, and that is the sun. So there, you always come to these myths that you have that the sun is chasing the moon. You know this love story, and they never seem to be able to reach one another and follow each other around the world. <laughs> chasing each other uh, but but, so, but but the world is flat oh yeah oh, yeah. <laughs> according to a lot of people out there they still think the world is flat i still would like to try and jump off the edge <laughs> you know I, I, I think it's a crack up is you know there are people all around the globe who think the world is flat work that all one around out. the globe <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about you wanting to jump off the edge, Yvonne. I'd like to throw no. Mark off the edge sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Mark, I wouldn't do That's that. That's okay. Sometimes I feel like jumping off the edge. Yeah. You see if there's like this magnetic field, you just actually then stand upside down, don't you? Are you just all of a sudden just go flick and stand at the bottom of the world then? Hmm. What look like? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wait, let's see. If you fall off the edge of the world, then what do you hit? Yeah, well, nothing. Are you just actually just like, uh, like one of those tapes that goes around and your feet just stick and it just goes around the edge and you just walk upside down like a, a fly on the ceiling kind of thing? You know That'd what be I mean? Interesting. That would be good, wouldn't it? Yeah, maybe you've got like. Mm. Uh, um, the continent of Africa on one side, you know, and, and, and Australia, and then you go on the other side, you've got North and South America or whatever. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> it's like flipping a coin. Mm-hmm. It's up. <laughs> okay, I'm way too sober for this conversation. <laughs> uh, I'm, st I'm scoffing these grapes here. I'll tell you what, I think grape juice is really getting to my head at the moment. The fermented grapes. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. I wish. No, it's um, something I do in every show. I eat grapes. And the only reason I eat grapes is to keep this bloody parrot quiet. <laughs> so he, sits there he sits there watching the grapes, and every now and then I chuck him one. I yeah. give him a grape. You, you don't stick your fingers in to give him one. You'll lose a finger. Sure, Christ almighty, no. No way am I doing that. Not with pickles. <laughs> oh. Anyway, getting back to the book. Getting back to the book. So, you saw you saw the um, the animals. You saw the the animals after they died. Were they the first thing that you actually saw? Those were the first ones when I started to associate that. Um, the, the spiritual side of things that there was another version of the same animal that mm -hmm. had left the color body, let's say that. Mm. Um, obviously, I saw the gray ones regularly in my bedroom and I, I, I learned that if I was scared or had a dream or whatever, that attracted them and I didn't yeah. understand why. Um, one of the things I describe, obviously, is, is one of the nightmares that I remember from the time. And I use that to explain to my daughter what the difference is between uh, dreams and premonitions and mm -hmm. visions. So what the difference is between them and what they mean. And one of them I used was obviously this nightmare where I went, I think, maybe, well, it feels like a hundred times I must have walked up and down my parents' bedroom. Um Saying that I couldn't sleep and and there was not I was not scared of the of the grey people standing in the room, but I also knew that I had to control my fear. Yeah, because other beings that were hanging around that I could feel and didn't want to look at. So that's already where it starts, and then I start to build up all these experiences. So you can actually follow it through, and then you mm. understand where I am coming from now and what I'm trying to do now. Because obviously the story has not finished yet, and there's far more to come. Because, trust me, I got myself into a lot of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> You're not living life unless you get yourself into trouble. Yes, yeah. You think you do things well and you do things good, but my God, honestly, it's, um, it was a good learning curve, I can tell you that. 
So, so it's more to come. I've been cursed by a, a shaman. Do you, do you, do wait, you class it as being a wait, curse? Wait, 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 wait. Back up a second here. We'll ask that question in a second. <laughs> you were cursed by a shaman? Yeah, I'm writing about this now in my second book. So I never believed in curse. Oh, I thought... I thought you said you, you it was a curse to him. No, no, no. I've been cursed because of a shaman. And uh, by that time, I was... <laughs> Mark's a shaman. No, I'm not. <laughs> I hope he's not going to curse me. No, I'm not a shaman. No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, well, I, I let's put it this way. I've gone through some uh, shamanic practitioner training uh, for healing. And... Uh, you know, so I know a little bit about it, but you know, I know I'm not a shaman. But the um, it, it's curious that a yeah, shaman, but that was that was a learning curve for you too, wasn't it, Mark? Well, yeah, it was. It's yeah. it's put me in some very uh, interesting new perspectives on things, mm. uh, which is curious that someone who would who would refer to themselves as a shaman would be putting a curse on somebody because that's not really what they do. <laughs> no, not what they're supposed to be doing, but they did, or he did. And uh, it's all to do with money. When money comes into it, then and, and there's not enough of it, that's when it starts to go wrong. Or jealousy and fear, yeah. competition. And when we think about spirituality or the paranormal world, people may actually get involved within this world, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're all nice people. There are some real rotten ones around <laughs> And it's a, it can be doggy dog, and nobody seems to well, enjoy. They, and they desserts. reckon money is the root of all evil. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, how did you find out, or how did you realize that you'd been cursed? Um, well, I didn't really in immediately find out myself because of this wonderful protection routine I used oh. in my youth, but. Um, it affected my children and my husband and, and when your young baby and your um, toddler um, both start screaming at the same time at night and your husband has like the weirdest nightmares ever and everything that could go wrong would go wrong and then um, I, was, I was phoned up by a lady who knew or worked for the same person that I used to work for and oh. she warned me and then it all fell into place but I would never, ever have believed anything like that if it wasn't for the weird people I met beforehand, <laughs> honestly. I don't want to say too much about it. <laughs> I want to keep it a little bit more of uh, something that will come out in my, in my second book. Because sometimes you meet people for a reason. They are put in place. Mm -hmm. I will give one little thing away. I was working in a, in a, in a shop. And I was helping out a friend every Monday. And one day, this guy in a suit, in a briefcase, walks in, walks up to me, and starts to chant in Arabic something. And by the time, I was already used with these really strange encounters anyway. So I politely waited for him to finish to find out what this was all about. My friend, Lendy, who you will find out in the first book as well, she looked at me like, who is this? You know, but I was being polite and first paid attention to this guy singing in Arabic. And then he stopped and he said, this is a part out of the Quran, and this is about witchcraft. Yeah. And he was going on about witchcraft and curses. And I thought, well, I'm not into witchcraft. I don't know. I don't believe in curses. I never thought about curses whatsoever. And then he, uh, and I thought, well, that's interesting. So just being polite. And he continued a couple of times with all sorts of passages out of the Quran. And when he finished, I thought, well, you know, ask him where he's from and where he's going to. He said, well, I just felt I had to walk into the shop, but I'm on my way to work. And I said, what do you do then? I said, he said, well, I work at King's Cross Hospital. I'm a surgeon. So you would never, ever associate this with somebody who works in a profession as a surgeon. But well. he took time. He felt drawn to me to talk about a curse. And this is not the first time this happened. It happened twice more with other mm -hmm. people. And it was not that long after that, indeed, I caught into this thing and uh, I worked for the shaman. And uh, then one of my colleagues woke me up not long after. I had these really weird things happening with my family in the house. And then uh, she said, 
I overheard him that he cursed you. So I said, well, you probably have to take it serious. And what on earth made him do that? He lost a court case against me. Uh, um, oh. That's there's more to it. More is, to this where, is this when you were working up round Spitalfields Market, where I used to go, by the way, Mark? <laughs> no, no, this was actually after. This was when I started to work for psychic fairs and little oh. going all over the country and, and uh, mm. readings, but it's that's a whole other story. But in my books, I open up this world and people can experience it and then judge for themselves what they think. I've met a lot of wonderful people. I've had also a lot of amazing experiences. Yeah. And then obviously also have the opposite. So I think it would be, I think it would be interesting for people to see things from a different perspective and, and, and mm. see what goes in on there and, and what it's like to actually work within that environment and how people are to one another. Oh, I agree. I totally agree. Don't you, Mark? Yeah, well, if whether you're not you're in a you know spiritual environment or regular everyday environment, you're going to have nice people and you're going to have jerks, and uh, we all need to be nice to each other. Yeah, you come across well, it's sort of nice to each other. Well. I I don't want to be nice to Mark. <laughs> it's no fun being nice to Mark. Yeah, well, there are times when you have to have your fun. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Very true. Well, Yvonne, we're we're coming up on the end of the show here. So um, just to wrap things up, now the book is called The Gray Ones, and it's coming out, uh, when is it coming out in April? It's the 4th of April, and it comes out uh, worldwide. But from what I understand, that it will be released with um, Amazon, um, so you can get it uh, downloaded on your Kindle. And if you are... Um, uh, Kindle Unlimited customer, it will be free for you. Um, if you, from what I understand, Amazon India, it will come out on the 12th of April or something. Um, it's already up on uh, on Amazon for pre-order. Um, and uh, yes, the print version will come out also on the 4th of April. So unfortunately, you can't put it up for pre-order. So that will be released on the same day. And um, hopefully the second part will come out in September this year. Mm. So in continuation and such. Fantastic. Oh, now, oh, lovely. where can people... Now, you have a website too. Yes. And it's very simple. It's actually just my name. It's Ivona J. Smith altogether. And it's the English Smith without the H. Yes. It's the Dutch equivalent. <laughs> and then the dot com. <laughs> Schmidt. Smith, S M I T, yeah, yeah, Smith, Smith, okay. yeah. There's the eight has fallen off. So, well, I, t- I tell you one thing: your book is very, very interesting, and, and I like it where you put the dates and your age, so that people know roughly what that chapter is, where it, where you are with that chapter. You know, that's very good. Yeah. So they can they can grow with me and, and experience and maybe try and analyze those premonitions themselves because they are very symbolic. I also mm. analyze dreams and I love analyzing dreams and I love to analyze visions. Oh yeah, I've been on um, the radio in uh, Northamptonshire before about dream analysis. Did a did a nice ah. little. Set. Well, Mark's been having a few funny dreams and I've had a few funny dreams lately. So hold on when you when we when we finish the show, don't go away. all right well thank you uh avon for being on the show tonight it's been wonderful talking to you and uh we're definitely gonna have to have you come back oh lovely i would love to it was really really absolutely fun being on your show with the two of you yeah it uh, went too quick it went too quick i thought we were coming up for half time and then they said we're finished Yes, we didn't get to take our, our normal break. So far away. <laughs> well, it would be good to have a cup of coffee sometime. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, thank you, everybody, for listening to another edition of the Paranormal UK radio show here on the Paranormal UK radio network. And, uh, Irene, where can people find us? Everywhere, people. Everywhere. Everywhere. iTunes, Stitcher, mm, Podbean, TuneIn Radio, TuneIn. Stream Live. Uh, and the paranormal and stream us live on the paranormal radio XLR app. XLR Radio FM. Yes. Um, 
Dark Matter Digital. Yep. Um, I can't think of There's so many, so there many so places. There's so many. Okay. People. All right. Well, Irene, have a great evening, and uh, we'll catch you all next week. Have a good one. Okay, bye.